This is a regular meeting of the Queen Anne's County Planning Commission. It's Thursday morning, May the 12th, 2011, 8.45 a.m. We're at the Department of Planning and Zoning, 160 Corsoball Drive, Centerville, Maryland. I'd like to remind everyone that these proceedings are being recorded uh, for later play on television, and by being here, you are agreeing to be shown on TV. Uh, first item of business, public comments. No one signed up. Is there anyone that would like to speak? Mr. Falstad. Thank you, Commissioners. I have to leave a little early today, so I, um, I wanted to talk about uh, Text Amendment 1114, which I think you'll be uh, taking up later on. Um, back in uh, March, I had filed a public information request dealing with this amendment, and um, Mr. Mon responded by giving me everything that he had uh, in a timely way. I'd, I'd like to recognize them for that. They they turned everything around pretty quickly. Um, however, in going through what they gave me, it's pretty slim pickings and really doesn't give any background at all to why this text amendment is, is being brought up. What it mostly is, is some email correspondence between um, Mr. Mon and Jody Schultz, um, who I think this text amendment may apply to on a project that he wants to do. But beyond that, it doesn't really have anything regarding um, any cost benefits analysis or anything like that. This text amendment was brought forward as a cost savings measure to the county, but it doesn't really address any of that. And so it's, right now it's all kind of um, unclear on why this is being brought up. However, as I read this, this text amendment, not only would existing subdivisions on private roads created after 1987 be able to increase their, their number of potential development lots to more than five, with planning commission approval, but new subdivisions of any size done entirely on private roads like Cove Creek Club um, could be developed also with planning commission approval. And so I guess what I'm asking right now is before you take action on this particular text amendment, that we really try and get more information, um, understand more about what the potential unintended consequences that this text amendment could have. I think there probably are some, but I also don't think the whole record's complete on on what we've gotten from the PIA. And uh, I would just ask that either you take no action on this today until we get more of an understanding of, of the unintended consequences, um, or if you need to take action today that right now you would deny the, deny the text amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay. Public comments are closed. Uh, next item is uh, minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, Sheila had forwarded me a couple of non-substantive spelling grammatical changes that I've made. Um, and then there was one other substantive change on page 11 in the last sentence of the motion at the top of the page. It's item 6, page 11, um, regarding the direction to staff. Um, and I have changed that language to read with direction to staff to provide language requiring off-street parking for multifamily units and forwarding to the county commissioners as attached tier two. <clears throat> I would move approval with those edits. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 That's approved. <clears throat> no extension request. Okay, legislative updates. Good morning, Chairman Richardson. Uh, Planning Commission uh, members. Um, Greg Todd, Queen Anne's County Administrator, here for our administrative up or our legislative update with the county commissioners. 
at the meeting on Tuesday, I'll go through a few of the things they did on Tuesday, there were a number of resolutions that they adopted that do with the uh, water and sewer allocation policy and sewer rate and water and sewer rates mm -hmm. in general. And I'm going to read through some of those real quick. 11-08 uh, was a resolution of the county commissioners of Queen Anne's County adopting a revised and updated water and sewer allocation policy. 1109 was a resolution of the county commissioners of Queen Anne's County adopting the 2011 Queen Anne's County Comprehensive Water and, Se water and Sewerage Policy, or plan. And then we get into Proposal 1A, which they approved as a resolution of the County Commissioners of Queen Anne's County setting as a Queen Anne's County Sanitary Commission to increase the annual rate adjustment for sewer rates in all sub-districts in the county from 2.5% to 6.5% to contribute to paying for the annual debt for service for the new enhanced nutrient removal wastewater treatment plant and fund depreciation of all sewer infrastructure assets. Resolution 11-11 was Proposal 2A. It's a resolution of the County Commissioners of Queen Anne's County setting as a Queen Anne's County Sanitary Commission to increase the annual rate adjustment for water rates in all sub-districts in the county from 2.5% to 5.5 to fund future water system improvements and to fund depreciation of all water infrastructure assets. Resolution 11-12, Proposal 3, was a resolution of the County Commissioners of Queen Anne's County setting as Queen Anne's County Sanitary Commission to achieve annual rate increases in user rates through increases in the usage portion of the total user rate for customers connected to public water. Resolution 11-13. Uh, it's their fourth proposal was a resolution of the County Commissioners of Queen Anne's County set in as a Queen Anne's County Sanitary Commission to set water allocation fees, which are the one-time connection fees for all residential and non-residential users to $16 per gallon in all sub-districts. <clears throat> resolution 11-14, Proposal 5, was a resolution of the County Commissioners of Queen Anne's County set in as a Queen Anne's County Sanitary Commission to set sewer allocation fees one-time connection fees for all residential and non-residential users at $28 per gallon in all sub-districts. And Resolution 11-15 was their sixth proposal was a resolution of the County Commissioners of Queen Anne's County set in as a Queen Anne's County Sanitary Commission to increase the septage disposal fee imposed in the Kent Narrow, Stevensville, Graceville area wastewater sub-district from six cents a gallon to nine cents a gallon to reflect the actual cost of the treatment. <coughs> and that uh, that finalized the uh, water and sewer plan and the water rate increase, sewer and water rate increases that they've been they've been uh, uh, debating over for the last few months. So that was that was good for them to get that done and moving forward. Like four years. It, well, <laughs> yeah, but these guys just the last oh, few no, months. These so. guys, <laughs> yeah, don't don't want to put that all on them. Right. No, don't put that. Yeah, on. they also agree to advertise. They have a number of boards and commissions uh, coming up at the end of June, and they agreed to advertise the planning commission vacancy as well with the uh, understanding that they're on the uh, June 7th meeting, they would like to go ahead and, and make that appointment. So they'll advertise for two weeks and then come back. They also While you're on that, let me yeah. just say, in case anyone's watching this on television, we do have a vacancy on the board. And uh, as Todd said, the, uh, they, the commissioner is planning on filling that on June the 7th. Yes, so they do. If, if you're interested in being on the planning commission, Get a letter into the commissioners. Absolutely, yeah. Right you away. can actually just just email just email me if you would at gtodd at qac dot org if you're interested. In, we'll get the application in, or you, we can help you get the application in. They also will be meeting weekly from now until the budget hearings uh, with budget workshops. They'll have a, a meeting next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, to start working through some of the some of the different budget issues. They approved the constant yield rate advertisement last week or this week and set it at 12 an increase of 12 cents uh, per hundred of assessed value on on a property which raises the rate from 0.767 cents per hundred to 0.887 per hundred um, <clears throat> that's not necessarily the, the property tax rate that will be approved but but per uh, legal requirements for advertising they can't set a rate in the advertisement and then go above it but they can set it and go below it and they also are advertising to uh, increase the income tax to the maximum allowed by the state which is 3.2 percent so those are the actions they took on the budget this past week so we are we are working through those and the budget hearings once again are june 13th at bayside elementary june 14th at 7 p.m june 14th is the constant yield hearing at 7 p.m at queen anne's county high school auditorium 
and June 15th at Sellersville Middle School at 7 p.m. So, 7 p.m. on all those. Um, and next, at their May 24th meeting, they are having the hearing on the comprehensive rezonings, and they also have a hearing on changing the health insurance benefits for county employees. So, okay. any questions? Very busy. <laughs> yeah. Greg, the uh, Department of Public Works meeting that was scheduled for yesterday and was canceled. Right. Is that literally canceled or just postponed? Uh, I think it's postponed. Commissioner um, Aarons has asked that uh, the the chair of that, Mr. Waring, address some issues that have come up as far as some letters that were received by various members of, of the uh, committee that weren't shared with others. So there's, mm -hmm. there's some outstanding issues there that they're going to try to address. Okay. Uh, but the public will have prior notice if it's... Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Sure. Thank you very much. Yep. Great. <clears throat> Steve? Uh, thank you. I don't really have any legal updates. I don't know if Chris has any as well. A quiet month is a good month <laughs> on the legal front. Um, however, um, I did attend the Economic Development Commission meeting, um, and they expressed their in interest in continuing to work with the Planning Commission on the um, commercial <coughs> land inventory. Um, they were very receptive to the joint uh, meeting. Uh, the, the request for a joint meeting and ask that I poll the Planning Commission members for some possible dates for that meeting. Um, their request was we either do it first thing in the morning or closer to the end of the day, you know, so it doesn't eat up the whole day. Um, but they are very open and, and would like to meet. Um, we did advise them that we would need time to post it as a special meeting and it would be recorded. Um, and um, the Planning Commission requested that it be a roundtable work session type uh, meeting and they felt that that's exactly the kind of meeting that needed to occur so um, we'd be looking at probably the week of the 23rd um, or possibly the next week if that's possible um, we could be ready by then or um, I'm available <clears throat> week of the 23rd I prefer the week of the 30th. I have uh, an afternoon problem on the 31st. <coughs> Other than that, I'm open. I got a morning problem on the 31st. Okay. I recommend the 30th then. Well, is that Labor Day? <laughs> Memorial oh, Day. Memorial Day. I mean, Memorial right. Day, You're not right, Labor Day. Wow. <laughs> Where'd the summer go? <laughs> Okay. It so is the week of the 23rd. No. We, we so that's out completely. Okay. Oh, it is. Yeah, that's out. Okay, so we have Wednesday, June 1st, or Thursday, June 2nd? First works. Yeah, either one of those works for me. First is good. Okay. And would you like uh, first thing in the morning, 8 a.m., or later in the afternoon, early evening? It's too morning. I prefer early morning myself. Okay. I don't, I, I can do either, but. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so we'll poll the um, EDC members for the first or the second 8 a.m. Well, let's let's see. Does how well, about the first, second, and third? Do all three of those days work for us? Yes. yes. Well, let, let's give them those three options: first, second, and third. Okay. And Barbara, the room Maybe is. Yes, okay. I mean, it's stack on there on the first, no. but we. No, we but the third is not good for me. <coughs> okay, first and second then. Sounds good. Um, Rob Gunther, who's been working on that project, will be here, and um, he's recommended that we also include um, a GIS person to assist us in moving moving it forward um, to make sure we understand what data is out there, what is available, and um, you know we don't that uh, we can make um, the most out of that meeting with and make sure everybody understands what data we do have and what we can compile and what what we can't. I think it would be good if uh, maybe you, I, Rob, and Bill Stoops could meet for 30 minutes to an hour ahead of that and just an all be together on what the agenda is going to look like and Absolutely. how we go about it. So you get in touch with us and okay. set that up. Absolutely. Okay. Good. Thank you. Anything else? Ellen, did you have anything? Okay. Anything else? Uh, Ellen, do you have anything for...
I, I don't. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Okay. <clears throat> Let's move into the text amendments. Uh, if you saw the revised agenda, 1107 has been moved to the end of the list. So we'll start with text amendment 1109. Additional use for nonprofit seasonal live performance dinner theaters in countryside uh, district. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, Helen Spinelli. Um, just to update you, this was um, tabled by you last, um, by the Commission last month, and we were requested to um, meet with the applicant and to review whether um, it may be possible under ex existing code. Um, and then also, as a follow-up, meet with Mr. Drummond, our Planning Commission counsel, to review those um, conditions. We did meet um, our um, permit coordinator also met with us, Vivian Swinson. We spent a good a good bit of time and thought we had something um, that, because they had had a previous conditional use on this in 1978, which we have a copy of, which is absolutely wonderful that we keep things like that. Anyway, um, we determined that, that we still needed to proceed with this text amendment, so that's why it's here. Um, I don't have any recommendations for any changes to what was submitted. Um, and Mr. Drummond, do you have any comments on that? Thank you. Um, so actually, it can just, whatever your desire, if you have any comments on it. it it's very specific. It has enough qualifiers in it that I don't think there's going to be, um, you know, it, it, it really is what it is. I'll just comment that I was involved in one meeting on this with uh, Thank you. Helen and uh, Chris, and uh, <clears throat> they can't do it the way it is. <laughs> we have to do something if, if we want to permit this. So. I would move we make a favorable recommendation. Second. Any discussion from any other members? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we will forward this with a favorable recommendation. Hmm. Okay, next is Text Amendment 1110 regarding disclosure on application for subdivision and site plan approvals. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this, the Planning Commission at the last meeting requested that staff meet with council and um, review what the opportunities are to um, address the issue of publicly traded um, entities and some other issues that came up that were heavily discussed at the last meeting. Um, and um, Mr. Um, Richardson, our chairman, was there as well in order to fully understand what we could do with this. And my memo to all of you um, is kind of the result of what we came up with. After a lot of discussion and, and trying to um, figure out how to do this, it, it, we just came to the conclusion that um, the Land Use and Development Code doesn't really deal with um, issues of conflicts and um, of interest and disclosures. Um, but we did suggest that we can add things to our application, um, which we had um, given to you before that could possibly, you know, ask for people to identify principal stockholders or, you know, corporate entity or, or something like that. So I'm... Um, I'll defer to our council and, and to the chairman, but I'm not sure I can come up with any more resolutions. And I, I'm, I'm frustrated that I can't help you more with this, but I, every time we came up with <coughs> language and stuff, we kept going back to how do we do that? How does it fit? And it just didn't seem to fit. One of the things we discussed was adding, <coughs> adding a line on the, at the bottom of the application. <coughs> And that got into the same death spiral that everything else does. Uh, how do you label a line and what do you ask for and so forth. Yeah. 
I might <coughs> comment we did <coughs> something wrong with my voice this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. We did receive a, uh, a comment. Uh, it was in our package from Business Queen Anne's that has their recommendation. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to interrupt, but oh. um, I did come up with some language based on the comment from Business Queen Anne's and the um, alternative draft I think that Mrs. Babb submitted to Mrs. Spinelli yeah. ye yesterday or the day before. I mean, it was quite late that it came in. I was, um, well, three, three observations, or two observations before I pass, well, I'll be, can pass this out in the meantime. Um, I was um, heartened to see that Business Queen Anne's and Ms. Babb actually uh, gave us suggestions that were very similar, um, very much uh, compatible with each other. And um, I thought we shouldn't miss this opportunity to consider, I have some more if you need one. We're, we're getting, it's coming down. Okay. Um, Can I have one? Please? Yes. Um, so I thought we shouldn't miss this opportunity to consider uh, making amendments that would make it work if we can. And the second observation is that while the ethics ordinance does deal with conflicts of interest, it only does so for public employees and for um, public officials. It's not intended to um, constrain the ethics of the, the public at large. And um, since this um, text amendment would appear um, as described by the people who petitioned us to introduce it, um, would serve the purpose of identifying conflicts of interest, obviously, of public officials or potential conflicts of interest in public employees. It also would um, make transparent the ownership of property and the contact, the people who might be contacted by the public who are interested in a particular development uh, to work out any issues that the community might have. So the draft I have before you starts with the text that Ms. Babb uh, forwarded. The portions that are highlighted in yellow are additions or changes to that. The strikeouts obviously are strikeouts or, or deletions. Um, the first of those that adds adds to the people exempted from making a disclosure, and the disclosure is on the application for approval, which was consistent between both Ms. Babb's draft and Mr. Waterman's draft. Um, the adds to the people who are excluded from that nonprofit organizations and community associations, those were raised as issues, I think, uh, when this, not this year, but in a prior consideration of, of a similar text amendment. It also adds language specifically from the Business Queen Anne's draft. The rest of the language actually is from the Business Queen Anne's Act, which is to um, include a contact person. And it, in the third set of changes simply makes the language consistent um, about uh, what kinds of changes are identified um, so that it doesn't introduce the term economic interest, which I think was a problem in the, pri in the original draft of the, of the thing. I left out the piece from Mr. Waterman's draft that, that required public officials to disclose their interests because I thought it was redundant. If everybody's disclosing their interests, that includes public officials. Uh, so public officials essentially have two places to disclose their interests, one, in, one under the ethics requ disclosure requirements and the, and the second if they are an owner of land. Um, so I, I thought this, um, this language was, met the interests of both the business community as expressed by Mr. Waterman on behalf of Business Queen Anne's and also the um, community of petitioners who originally um, requested that we deal with it and I thought I, I would, would be um, well served if we considered these amendments. I, uh, I think your efforts are wonderful, Sheila. Um, and uh, you certainly did try to blend the best of both worlds. When we talk about a contact person, and one of the things that was mentioned at the last meeting was uh, sometimes people don't know where to go to contact the person who's doing the subdivision. And my question to, to Helen or Steve uh, is, is there a, I mean, I thought there was. Yes. Okay. I mean, it, it, the application which you had in your packets last month, and I'm not saying that, you know, 
it says um, it says um, project type, and then it has contact information, owner's name, and then it actually has owner's address, owner's phone, company name of proposed owner, contract purchaser, proposed owner, contract purchaser, proposed owner's contract purchaser's address, and so on. Email, fax, that's already on the application. Developer's name, developer's address, the agent's name, agent's address, and agent's email. So this is all, um, so not every application has every one of those items for sure, because there's not always a developer, there's not always, but we, you know, um, and you'll, when you get a, um, a staff report for a major subdivision or site plan, we will list all of that information on that, you know, to say who's the developer, who's the purchase, who's the contract purchaser, and who's the who's the actual owner of the property. So anyway, I mean, if you want to put it, um, so the, there there are contact people absolutely. on the application if people want to know. I, I'm I'm a huge advocate of transparency, and I think um, that's. You know, just a, a wonderful way to do business, to run a government, um, to run a personal life. But it's it seems like no matter how hard we try with this text amendment, it's not going to change the way we do business. It's just going to add layers of bureaucracy and layers of work uh, onto the paperwork that's filed. And so I uh, can't see where we're going to gain anything from this text amendment. I can't see what layer of work it adds, to, I mean, other than to write down the names of people who own the property. Keeping it I mean, updated. How, up, up to 25 people. Well, during the course, only during the course of the development proposal, how much does that change typically during the course of a development yeah. proposal? I wouldn't think very often. I wouldn't think yeah. so either. Yeah. Well, but, it I mean, could, though. I mean, it say, could. say there's a, a, according to what you have here that, that Terry had put forward, if it was a company with 25 shareholders, then they'd all have to be listed. What if one of them dies? Well, what if one of them, uh, sure. And, know, and I mean, the same, lots of things the that same is happen. true of our ethics disclosure. As you acquire properties during the year, I'm sure you add them to your disclosure so that that's up to date. I mean, it isn't, it isn't really an onerous task for most of America, it, it, or most transactions. What is it? Somebody can die, of course. What, what's <laughs> going to be the end goal? Yeah, that's that's, that, the, that's the always end, been the question. Right. What, I mean, what does this solve? What's well, going to change? I have change? to believe the people who petition for the change when they say the end goal is so that the public knows who, um, who owns the land. And if they have a question about it, they, um, they can talk to them. But there's already a contact point listed on um, the application. I think maybe this would help, um, and, and Steve just brought this to, to our attention, notification form to adjacent property owners. Maybe on this, we um, this is a form that the, um, that the developer con or contract purchaser has to send when we're doing a, uh, a development um, in the county to an adjacent property owner. So... We could possibly, it's the applicant's name, the project name, the contact person, um, if applicant is a corporation, applicant's address, and then if the property is owner is different, we have all of that information on here that goes to... Could you put it on the overhead? Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. What is that machine called? It's a document reader. Uh, okay, because I just referred. I to don't it. understand how that live picture doesn't show <laughs> Murray and myself. In that chair. <laughs> I'm having a real problem. With that. <laughs> <laughs> Not too subtle. It's an alternate reality. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you see? I mean, I can. I, I think if you go over it now, Helen, we'll... Yeah. That's, that's real transparency, right? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I was transparent right now. <laughs> uh, so it starts with, in accordance with county regulations, property owners that are adjacent to a property, the local volunteer um, fire department, fire and EMS commission uh, that has submitted an application, the Department of Planning and Zoning for subdivision and site plan approval must be notified prior, prior to the submittal of an application. So all of this has to be done before they actually submit an application to this office. And what they do is they bring certified letter uh, notifications that they've sent to adjacent property owners. So it's the applicant's name, the project name, the contact person, um, if applicable as a corporation. In other words, if it's not owned by the person, then the corporation's con contact person, um, applicant's address. 
if the property owner is not the same as the applicant listed above, the following property owner's name and property owner's address. So, you know, if it's different, like a, a citizen can go and contact the prop the actual property owner saying, do you know what this is about this? And then, a and then the agent, um, which is the surveyor or the engineering company, location of the project, a property, um, and the street address um, and description. So we've got three layers of contact on there. You've got the applicant who may be doing the subdivision. Right. You've got the property owner, and then you have the agent of the the pro the um, engineer or whoever of the, uh, of the project. But isn't the um, the on that list? Isn't it acceptable if the property owner is uh, Big Corp LLC? Mm -hmm. Uh, isn't it possible to just put Big Corp LLC in the address of the corporation? Sure. So you never know who no, it says but, contact but if, person, though. It but if, a, but if, who is probably the attorney for the But, but for if the LLC. Big Corp LLC is Mary and I, right. and Mr. Clark is our contact person, right? Um, what difference is it to the person who wants information, whether they contact Mary and I or they contact Mr. Clark? Either way, the information is still coming back to the company. And it's not going to change our vote either way, whether Mary and I own the property and you don't like, you know, one of us, or um, or you're contacting Mr. Clark. Well, I, I I mean I'm not here to defend the petitioners petition, but what they said is that they like they like to be able to talk to the people who actually are the owners. <coughs> yeah. I, I can understand that. I mean, if you go to I, court, I you, the attorney sure. argues on behalf of the owners, but you're entitled to have him there and to cross-examine him and all of that sort of thing. I mean, this is not a court action, but I have to believe them when they say that that's why they wanted to know the people behind the the corporate mm -hmm. entity name or or non-corporate limited liability corporation or whatever um, name. And I simply I just was don't trying feel to like find I a way <clears throat> to accommodate that. If it's not inconsistent with with what we do without any requirement to do so, I don't know why we would be so resistant to, um, to putting it, to, to documenting it in the law so that it's an ongoing thing I, and not I subject to... I feel like the information is either going to end up being inaccurate, add a lot of time to staff and, and applicants' uh, time, uh, and it's, the outcome isn't going to be any better or any worse. And so it's just adding layers of bureaucracy for for no benefit um, for a decision that we would need to make. I'm, I'm struggling with the idea that there's no benefit to making citizens feel comfortable that they have all the information they need in terms of what is going on in the county. Um, I don't understand the resistance to this. Uh, I think it's important to remember that this original text amendment was submitted by three of the previous commissioners, one of whom is a lawyer. So evidently they thought there was some clear benefit to be obtained from having more information. I would also remind you that they uh, chose not to meet with us too um, when we volunteered to discuss the <coughs> issue. So I'm not sure how important it really was to them. Um, I, I think we could discuss this forever. I think um, we all have a really good understanding of uh, what the citizens are trying to accomplish and, and, uh, and the ultimate outcome of it. Um, I'm going to make a motion to send an unfavorable recommendation uh, for this text amendment. But I would also like to thank everyone's efforts on trying to come together on this. I think that's a great, great um, process. I second your motion. Okay, we have a motion to send an unfavorable recommendation. It's been seconded, and more discussion on that. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. The motion passed three to two. Okay, next one is the uh, Rhodes Text Amendment 11-14. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, in, the, in the reorganization of the agenda, that 
item was specifically listed at a specific time of 945. Um, we did know we had interest in it, um, and then we were did also notify the Department of Public Works. So being able to move that up, um, uh, we didn't feel comfortable moving that up, changing that time when some people were looking for some specific notification to that. Okay. Um, under miscellaneous staff items, one of the things in, in the bags was um, revised architecture from the McDonald's. Um, give me a second. Let me see if those uh, people were, were here, but we could take a look at that. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of progress on that. Uh, we did want to bring it back to the Planning Commission. Get some That'd be good. <coughs> While we're while he's going for that stuff, I would just like to comment. Um, while I was quite harsh on Mr. McDonald's, whoever he was when he was here, <laughs> um, I did drive by one of their new prototypes in Glen Burnie, and it was nowhere near as ugly as I thought it was going to be. Not that I think it's appropriate for this particular <laughs> site because of how you can see it. It was nowhere nowhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. This one. Yes. Yeah. It really doesn't look bad. It's on the right hand side up, uh, I don't know where the car dealers are before you get to 695 and it, in that setting it, it looked good. I think I, it I, may be context because I drove by one in Delaware and it looked awful. <laughs> <laughs> much, much worse than I had thought that it would look. <laughs> I, I agree with Sheila. I, I saw one in Bowie and I, I, I didn't like it at all. You all don't have to worry about that. <laughs> But I am waiting on the architect. He should be okay. here in a second. The, okay. the architect will be here in um, hopefully just a few minutes. Um, I will uh, take this opportunity to make the Planning Commission aware. Um, the county has been, over the last year, um, dealing with uh, challenges to the adequate public facilities ordinance. We have had um, several entities with pending projects challenge some of the methodologies that the county's been using, um, some of the queuing or who's in the queue actually you know in this time where a lot of projects have stopped stalled um, specifically taken action not to move forward or lost approvals um, the queuing of who's in the queue is um, becoming more and more difficult APFOs are staging tools of, to stage the um, the amount and a quantity of growth in a certain period of time in relation to the infrastructure available. Um, in times where you have a lot of development pressure, it acts very different in times where there isn't very much. Um, so we are being challenged. We are going to bring that information to the Planning Commission in June, give you a full briefing on that. Um, one of the big issues is school capacity. Obviously, you know, the, the county's been in a school moratorium for about four years now um, with a lack of high school capacity. Um, the big challenge um, and legal challenge that has uh, been posed to the county is how we calculate the capacity of Mattapeak Middle School. Um, we have a school that was built as a middle school. It's acting as part middle school, part high school. The county received funding for um, high school seats. Um, so the county has always taken the position that these are middle school seats with high school students in them, but we have taken money for them as high school seats. So we are working through that. We have been working closely with Chris, um, and we'll be briefing the Planning Commission in full on those issues in June. So. I don't know if this is an appropriate time to raise this, but I noticed in the paper a court case that uh, in another county, and I don't even recall now where it was, um, that challenged a requirement that funds be donated to fire departments. And I think that we have such a requirement in this county. Um, and I'm wondering if we could get a briefing at some future time about whether, whether there's any applicability of that decision for this county, and um, if so, I, what it is. I think when that provision was included, we all recognized that um, it required the uh, goodwill, so to speak, of the uh, developer, <laughs> and that. But it is a requirement in our law, isn't it? It's the not requirement a that they meet and a voluntary requirement. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> a requirement <laughs> that they meet, meet to discuss the discuss impact. Discuss the impact and try to come up with a. Okay. A, a, an amount that would satisfy the 
fire departments. Now, well, we don't require an agreement. No, it, no. Um, so it requires the, I said goodwill, perhaps good faith of the property owner and or developer. Um, if they do not reach an, any sort of an agreement, I'm not sure that we, the Planning Commission be in a position to deny an application. If the Planning Commission denied an application because it felt that there should be such an agreement with a volunteer fire company, I'm not sure that would stand up. Right. Maybe if you could t take a look no, at sure. the case and see no. if there are any elements. Well, I, I just I saw it in the newspaper, so I don't have. Right, and I'll it was re it was within the last month or so, I think. Okay. Um, and it's someplace in Maryland. But do you know <laughs> if it was an appellate decision or a... I don't, I'm sorry, I should have cut it out, okay. and I didn't, and I, I'm I sorry. I don't think it's an appellate decision, because I, I see those every day. It may not have been. Okay. Now, that was one thing. Um, that text amendment had a, um, a long life and four different iterations, yeah. um, starting with a mandatory donation, <laughs> um, and then ultimately... I didn't think that would be enforceable. And then it ultimately resulted in um, the the requiring a meeting between the parties to see if they could, uh, and that basically was given the volunteer fire department the opportunity to make the request. Was really what it what it boiled down to. Sort of the Grohlman amendment. Mr. Grohlman, who was on the planning commission back in the '80s, every single time somebody came up with a subdivision uh, application, he always asked, "Have you talked to the volunteer fire company yet?" Every month, that question came up. Okay. If For those who are wondering what's a, going on here, uh, we had a very short agenda this morning, <laughs> and uh, we actually overestimated the amount of time it was going to take to, <laughs> to do what we're doing, so we're, we're just stalling, waiting for time to elapse until we can. If we had a paid, paid fire uh, emergency services system in the county, that might raise uh, a possibility for something like a fire tax or something like that, but we don't have that. So I actually think it was a it was maybe that a condition was imposed to make a contribution for fire protection in a in a county where there was a paid fire system. It may not have been a volunteer company donation, but right, whatever it is, I just wanted right, us to fine. be protected if our language just puts us in a. Do you remember what paper it was in? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a like, list of what I subscribe to. <laughs> 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 like, uh, I'm a news junkie, so it's a long list. <laughs> uh, all right, all right. Should we take a break? What's, why are we looking at a Chick-fil-A now? What, uh, <laughs> do we have... Let's see where... Who are we expecting on the... Um, the we... Originally, when McDonald's came in, they had a standard prototype. Um, no, after, I mean, who are we expecting personnel-wise? Um, an, an architect that worked on the actual drawings. Um, following the prototype, they um, went out and actually got an architect to help. Um, oh. Okay, let's let's go ahead. No, this this was under um, this this came in, and we felt that we wanted to give the planning commission an update. They're trying to get at least an idea whether this would be moving forward or or they're moving in the right direction. Um, they aren't asking for any type of approval or anything like that. This does qualify as a minor, but um, the architecture is something that they did want to bring back to the planning commission. So you want to set up the. This is a continuation, if, if you, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, yeah, would you ahead. like me to? Yeah. Okay. This is a continuation of the discussion that was um, the, before the Planning Commission a couple months ago where, and the project is to take down, is to build a replacement McDonald's on the same site in Chester at the corner of uh, Castle Marina Road and Route 50, 301, and then um, build it in the parking lot and keep the current McDonald's open and operating until they'd be able to um, um, remove that, put in parking where that, that building is, and then um, you know continue we, operations. We saw a uh, <clears throat> very comprehensive uh, proposal that included uh, building the new one, keeping the old one <coughs> uh, operational until the new one was built, and then re-landscaping, changing the parking lot, uh, a very comprehensive uh, proposal on uh, uh, stormwater management and everything else, and 
basically we were uh, favorably impressed with the whole uh, situation except for the appearance of the new building. <laughs> and uh, we've had, uh, uh, though you just got here, we've had uh, at least three members that have seen the uh, examples of that new building. One liked it and a couple didn't like it. So, <laughs> But anyway, uh, we're here today to take a, another look at uh, a revised uh, rendition of the Great. building. Th thank you, Joe Stevens. Uh, on behalf of McDonald's, I have Sarah, I'm sorry, Sarah. Ginsburg. Ginsburg, who was the architect. Um, and then, obviously, um, you all know Jeff Bell, who is uh, a McDonald's representative here today. Uh, and Christina might be coming in. We're a little ahead of what we thought yeah, we'd be yeah, today. We are. But thank you. We appreciate it. We're always <laughs> glad to get in here. Uh, we heard you loud and clear a couple of months ago, three or four or five months ago, whenever it was in January. January, um, and McDonald's had um, uh, shown you one of the, um, as, as Barry had indicated, Mr. Waterman, um, showing you one of uh, what they're doing in terms of their overall comprehensive facelifts throughout the country and rebuilds throughout the country. Um, and you all believe that it didn't fit and you had some, uh, it didn't um, comply with the design guidelines, had, didn't have the elements that you all wanted to see. So what McDonald's had to do was then go to back to corporate and see if they had the authority in this instance. Uh, versus just keeping what they had, but to retain an outside architect, because they don't do that in-house. And that's, in fact, what they did. They retained uh, Sarah's firm uh, to go back, take the design guidelines, work with staff, and uh, and come up with a, what we believe is a much better product that we hope that you're all satisfied with so we can move forward with uh, site plan and construction. What Sarah will do is just take a couple minutes to go through how those elements are, um, are were derived, um, how they um, uh, incorporate many of the elements that are applicable in the design guidelines and incorporate many elements that you've seen in other projects, smaller commercial projects that you've approved in recent years um, on Ken Island and in the Chester, Stevensville uh, growth area and in the town center district. So with that, Sarah, if you can go ahead and just take a couple of minutes and walk the planning commission through the design. Um, I'll, I'll stand and sure. go through this. Okay. So I've prepared a little bit of an opening statement to kind of just guide you through how we've achieved um, these elevations and, and the recent building that we've come up with. So um, as Joe said, I'm Sarah Ginsburg. I'm from Chesapeake Design Group Architects. Um, we are a Maryland-owned firm, and um, we were brought in to kind of have a better understanding of the area and, and how we can associate the site with the character of um, the neighborhood. So uh, would you pick up that microphone stand there and just move it over sure. in front of you? I Absolutely. Think. Yeah, that, that helps for the recording. Okay. Um, so in any event, uh, we have been to the site and we're also working on other projects in the area. So we've familiarized ourselves with recent developments in the area, especially smaller restaurants and um, small scale commercial projects. So we've also familiarized ourselves with the design standards and guidelines um, and we think we have achieved something that um, definitely fits within those standards. Um, we have a sense of what we think we're looking for based off of the precedent images that were given to us. Um, and so by analyzing them, the example in the examples in each stand alone and didn't appear to necessarily be borrowing elements from one another. So we reevaluated and internally developed numerous options. Um, and we decided to go back to the basic premise that our building um, on the basic premise of our building and then elab elaborate other elements of the building. So Specifically, we went back to the notion that we should celebrate the entrances and that by and then embellish the public dining areas and the remainder of the building. So by marking or celebrating the entrances, we incorporate the use of the stone, which you see on all the, the major entrances. Um, also the use of the yellow awnings, which also mark entrances, and the welcome sign and branding elements, which are all part of the national branding philosophy. The stone, by virtually being a contrasting um, element, further enforces that celebration of the entrance. The dining room, which is this entire area here, um, terminates in a corner tower, which we feel addresses both the Route 50 side and the Castle Marina Road side. Um, and it allows the public, by virtue of these large windows, to, excuse me, um, to see that the, the bright and inviting interior will be a welcoming place for them. So we have further articulated the drive-through side, which is on the next page. What 
el what elevations are we looking at? Can you orient us to where the streets Absolutely. are? Absolutely. This is the Castle Marina Road side, so what we um, consider is the front elevation. This is the Route 50 side, which we also feel is a, a major elevation for visibility from the road. This is the rear of the building on top, and this is the drive-through side, which faces more of the neighborhood. Um, so the drive-through side, um, we have articulated, we think, in a, a pleasant manner as it faces the township with the use of the cornices and varied um, elevations of the roof. And, you know, overall, um, McDonald's philosophy through its design is to enhance the customer experience. At the end of the day, we feel that the result in design is true to itself. It adheres to your standards and guidelines with the use of the cornices and the use of the um, very high quality and durable materials in the neutral color scheme. Um, it, it uses the awnings and arcades, which are also um, part of your design guidelines and standards, which these are the arcades, these are the arcades and all the different awnings. Um, again, the yellow awnings to highlight the entrances and the more subdued neutral color awnings to that um, represent the dining area. Um, we also feel that it's respectful of the location as, and is an asset to the site. So um, I can walk through each elevation and point out all the different elements that we used. So um, maybe, again, maybe Sarah. Also, you can look at them in terms of if you looked at other commercial, small commercial buildings along the Kent Island area that have recently been developed mm -hmm. and approved, and how you incorporated some of those elements. Absolutely. So um, a lot of those elements that were used were the the use of like an overall brick feel. Um, more of a, the, the colonial with the, the, high art, uh, the high cornices that vary at different levels to make it feel more inviting, neighborhood friendly, and um, also pedestrian friendly. Um, we feel that, again, the, the varied windows almost make it feel uh, as part of a neighborhood. Um, on on the drive-through side, as I, as I intended before, or as I said before, um, the raised cornice that the varies in, in roof elevation is, is one of the main things that we, we make feel a little bit more welcoming and, and part of um, the local character. So, that's... Oh, do you want me to hold it up or...? Um, the bottom? They provided a perspective. These, these renderings don't show uh, oh, yeah, right. this is actually an L-shaped building. This makes it look very square. They did provide perspectives. I've got them. Would be helpful. I, have them. Okay. I have them right here. Here you go. I can. Go ahead and hold them up for So, um, as this gentleman said, um, it is an L-shaped building, and you think that these 3D renderings definitely give a little bit of a better feel how this building will actually look. And what's the, what views are they getting here? Um, so right here, this is the corner of Route 50 and Castle Marina Road. So this would be one of the main visibility if you're turning off of Route 50. Um, so this is that, that tower element, which uh, we feel is definitely a big part of um, of what the local character is. That about how much of a bump out is that in the tower element? Roughly in feet. From from the Limit. rest of the major aspect of the building? Um, I think it's about 20 feet. I don't know okay. off the top of my head. Okay. I apologize. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, well, you, you might be able to get a better understanding from one of the other. Uh, no, there not that one. Um, so this this is a <coughs> flat side, but we, um, you know, we wanted to break up the elevation, which, again, is part of your design standards. Um, what, what you're saying is that that end view that faces Castle Marina mm -hmm. right here, is right there. longer than the end view that faces the opposite direction. Right. Um, actually, no. Uh, it's the, just the, the bump part out. that extends back mm -hmm. is narrower than that. Stick part it under the reader. Right there. Um, just the we just learned oh. that it's called a reader. Oh, well, you're way ahead. You're way ahead. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I it's awfully it. dark. That's so uh, as you can see from the elevations, this is actually the longest elevation. Right. Um, if you know, because this would be included. However, the, it, the it, part at your left hand, <coughs> right there. Yes. The the end view that's looking that way, and then the end view way over here on the extreme right. Yes. They are not the same width. Um, no, no. This is much smaller, and that's set back. If if that's mm -hmm. what you're asking. Oh, this and this, you mean? It's an L. It's an L shape. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. L-shaped. Yeah. The long part goes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> okay, I apologize. Yeah, you, it wasn't... Look, you should have gotten one that goes oh, the the overhead there. Should have done a model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I keep waiting for the guys with the bows and arrows to rise up from the parapet. This, this view like. might make you, under yeah, there you understand go. a little there bit more. Ooh, okay, yeah. so I knew we had one of these somewhere. So this, yeah. yes, is an L-shape. So, okay. again, th this view gives it a little bit more of a broken up um, feel, not like this giant mass of a building. This, what is the height on this? Um, the, the top of the hearth element, which is, um, this is a, a, a drive-through hearth to mark where the drive-through is, the tallest, tallest point is 24 foot two. The overall building is about um, 22 foot two is, is okay, at so the highest part the, right the here. The poor little people that are here, uh, this is not the scale in any way. Oh, absolutely. Mm. It is the scale. Yes. yes. So that Two building is, high. what, three and a half times taller mm -hmm. than? Yeah, uh, uh, those people are about six. five foot six is, is five foot six to six. Yeah, uh -huh, the, the okay. average person is, is what they're I think um, I, I looked at that rendering and saw the same thing. That from that perspective, it looks like a very large tower on mm -hmm. the corner. But when you look at the actual renderings and see the adjustment in the roof line, I think that's a gives you a better idea on how much taller that corner piece will be than that one perspective. Okay. And then when you look at some of the other perspectives, um, like this one, I think that's a more mm -hmm. um, representative. representative uh, but okay. you put the, uh, this one from last time that has the Route 50 view on the right down reader. This side. Yeah, up on the board, yeah. No, uh, no, no, not that yes. one. Not that, that one. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, that was the Route 50 view last time. And you take a look at that compared to what you're showing today, I think that's a tremendous, tremendous improvement today. Mm -hmm. but, uh, be the benefit of an architect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that was really the, the deciding factor was McDonald deciding to go to outside architecture for this as opposed to internal. Sarah, I, I have a, uh, a design standard. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's coming from back there. Yeah. I apologize. I, I'm a bit, I can throw my voice. Personal <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, you know, I, the brick is great, and mm -hmm. I, I, a, a question I've had about design is the stone that you have uh, mm -hmm. on there, uh, what sort of stone is that? And I don't want to get into the super details of it, just, you know, let's stay on the surface, but sure. where I'm going with my question, so you know uh, when you answer me, is I think about brick being kind of native to the area. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our buildings that are 200 years old are made from brick and, and clapboards and those sorts of things. And when I see that stone, um, you know, when I plow my fields, very rarely do I plow up a stone. Uh, and, uh, and I probably couldn't build a building out of the stones that I, uh, I did plow up. So um, I'm just wondering about the stone, and I actually prefer the white on the other McDonald's more, but that's my personal opinion, and I don't know that we need to discuss that. So just wondering about the stone. Um. Well, I have, I guess, a couple different answers for that. Um, the stone is a very durable material, which, again, is part of the design um, guidelines is that we use high-quality durable materials. It's a veneer stone. Um, it's very, very natural looking. It, we feel that it complements the brick very well. I actually have an image um, that, Jeff, I don't know if you mind sharing that Robert and I have printed out, from another project that we've recently completed that has the actual stone on it, um, again, with a natural brick. and. Um, why don't you put it in that, whatever that's called. What's it called? The, the reader. The reader. You have to tell it to read. You have to you tell it. Push it. the thing. Read. Push. There we go. Yeah. Um, uh, we just feel that this picture gives an overall sense of what we're trying to achieve with the building, that it's a very welcoming place at the, ar um, the arcades. You know, it just feels like a, a, a town feel. It doesn't feel like a, a giant building. Um, so, again, the stone, I don't know if you can see very well in this picture, but it it's a very clean looking stone and um, actually as we were driving on our way down here we've I noticed um, a recent building that did have stone on it and I, I personally did feel like it did complement the the natural subdued look you know, I, I feel like these buildings aren't trying to um, you know necessarily stand out with these you don't want any kind of new material or 
anything that doesn't look natural to the area. And I, I understand what you're saying, that it, it's not what you dig up, but it's, it, it feels um, prevalent. Sorry. Oh, yeah. well, I like to think of it as river rock, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the whole, um, the whole De Donato strip, mm -hmm. starting with Red Apple yeah, Plaza just, and going up to um, Adam's Ribs, mm -hmm. so that all has the stone I on know. it as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it's good. compatible. I've been waiting to ask the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the use here is really the minority of the building. The majority of the building is the brick, so it's, yeah. it's an element, not really the, the main feature of it. I think it's a big step forward. Well, I, I do think it's a step forward, but I still remain confused because at the, la the last time we discussed this project, I don't think this board could have been more clear in terms of we wanted something like Safeway or Chick-fil-A uh, and I see absolutely none of the characteristics of those two projects in these drawings and I wondered why the choice was made to just not consider that. Uh, Go ahead Sarah, sure. Um, it, they were definitely considered. Um, I, we have the precedent images sitting on my desk, you know, that we referred to, um, you know, the main elements that we took from it, it the way we looked at those pictures and the, and the precedent images were not to take them literally, but to get the overall essence of the building um, by use of the brick and the, the natural subdued colors of the two different bricks. Um, we decided to keep the varied elevations of the flat cornices instead of, you know, gabled roofs and um, just we felt that we gave the same the overall feel as one of those buildings that you explained, um, but with keeping to our own yeah. and identifying McDonald's as, a, as its own. I, in my opinion, that has nothing like the feel of the Safeway. Nothing. But. Well, you know, to that benefit, they put in the vertical elements. Mm -hmm. uh, they broke up the horizontal lines with different <coughs> coloring, different type materials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it it's a far more attractive yeah. building. Really, I, I, I think yeah. you did a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Really did. I, I, yeah. Thank, thank you okay. for making the, the strong effort to uh, improve a very bland building. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I, more one, one more question. You go put in leather uh, accoutrements inside like the others are doing? <laughs> <laughs> they will be all padded seats. I, uh, I nice. saw something in the paper the other day about McDonald's going leather. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've read that same article. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If I could ask the Planning Commission, uh, this is an informal review of design and architecture. This is a minor site plan and it's a rebuild of an existing building. It wouldn't typically be before you. Right. Um, and, uh, and we've talked with staff. We think staff is comfortable working out the last few issues in design that we have. Uh, and as long as we don't materially deviate from what we've shown here, um, we'd like to be able to just move forward. We'd like to be able to just move forward with the minor site plan and do that in-house with the planning staff, which is, you know, very typical, except for this, you know, the focal point of the design elements on this. Commission okay with that? Uh, I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you very Appreciate much. your Thank effort. You. Thank you. I'd just like to say, uh, Commissioner Howard, if you need some rocks, <laughs> I got plenty of rocks. How many brick did you pile up? Count your I knew when I started to ask the question, I was making myself a target, but uh, I got my question answered. <laughs> Okay, are we ready for text amendment 1114 now? I do so Chief of um, Roads for the Queen Anne's County Department of Public Works, Alan Spinelli, Planning and Zoning. Um, oops, gotta get to the right text one. Okay. So 
always the last one. Okay, um, text amendment 1114, private roads created after uh, November 1987. Planning Commission, we reviewed this last month and suggested that we create requirements that the Planning Commission could use when determining when a private road was appropriate. Um, I met with uh, this, uh, the chairman, Mr. Richardson, and um, Steve Cahoon, and, and um, Council Mr. Drummond, and we, we talked about what was really meant by doing that. So we, I added the, the original language that we had last month, and, um, in, which was in section 18-1-1. Um, 89 B 1 and then added a, a number 3 to um, which would say the Planning Commission may approve greater than five lots on a private road with the following conditions these conditions were collaborated by uh, among the four of us to come up with what we thought may be appropriate but we're certainly open to any other suggestions that you might feel very comfortable um, adding. So let me just go through those. A, the road is constructed to public road standards and meets any other requirements from the Department of Public Works and access for, five, for fire and emergency service is maintained and public utility easements are provided and the connectivity to public roads will be maintained and a favorable recommendation from the Department of Public Works is provided and any other conditions that the Planning Commission may impose based upon specific site conditions or other considerations. So, um... Ellen, what... Or Shane, what, what is the rationale be behind requiring a private road to meet the public road standard? I'm so and, glad and, and you may, asked that. Maybe I'm wrong, but <laughs> but I believe that if you drive through Talba County, you see lots of roads that are narrower than our roads. They're yes. perfectly fine. There's less impervious surfaces. There's less to maintain for whoever's maintaining it to pay for it. And I don't see junk burned up cars in the ditches all over the place. Um, I don't know that they have any more accidents than we do. So I'm just wondering why do we want to, if someone wants to go do something, and for some legitimate reason that they can convince us to approve it, um, we say yes you can have a private road there why do we care whether it meets the public road standard uh, the public road standards were developed in cooperation with um, our Department of Emergency Services and our, um, and with uh, the local fire companies um, so that's where the WIS pretty much came from um, I, I know very well the road you talk about in Talba County I, I live in Talba County um, and um, you know I would say some of those could be considered somewhat deficient and the width um, for the type of loads that go down, especially with the farming community um, and other things. Uh, so, the, the, also we also have, and we've all seen, where numerous private roads have come under county ownership eventually. Um, whether they fail or the citizens that live on there don't want to pay for the, the maintenance of it and they and want the county to take it over, that's done at their expense to fix the road up and we take it over. Um, and when we when we do that, part of that is uh, typically widening out the existing private road to a, our standard. So the idea behind the current private road standard, it's right away with its uh, base width, is typically so that it can easily fall in line with our current standards and right into our roads network without much upgrade or the need for whoever owns the road or maintains the road at that time, that there wouldn't be extreme cost to them to have the county take it over. Private roads I, are, the, private, the paved section of a private road is no narrower than a public road. It, the, the that's width my of, point. I, I don't think that's a legitimate position for us to take. If we're going to allow someone to have a private road, no, we don't mandate right. what size car they're going to drive. We don't mandate how, how, how they drive on that road other than the speed limit. So why would we say a road's got to be 50 feet wide and have 24 feet of paving if, if that developer, or property owner, and the people who want to live there eventually say, we want to live on a community that has less stormwater to concern with. We want to, we want to be more environmentally friendly. We want to spend less money. Whatever their reasoning is, I think those are legitimate reasons that I can see that the fire department and emergency services have to buy in that the road's adequate. But, but I don't see how it makes any sense at all to require a public road standard for a private road 
if they can make the fire department emergency services happy. If in fact the county's going to take that over sometime in the future, it's because the, whoever lives there sometime in the future says we want you to take it over and we'll pay to upgrade it just like every place else in the county that's ever done that. And every place that has private roads has not chosen to upgrade, nor have they chosen to widen their roads. So, I, 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 I mean, I, I think that the idea behind this is all good, but I just don't think that that's a legitimate thing that we should put in here. Well, that, if you wanted to, if you wanted to change the private road standards, you couldn't do it on this text yeah. amendment. I, I understand that, but, but that we're debate, we're going to you're include. You're having a debate that perhaps you're you're creating a debate that perhaps should have happened in 1987 because those have been the standard that standard has been in place since 87. And I've had a problem. That <laughs> well, uh, it seems to me that, uh, I, and I didn't live here in 87, but it seems to me that um, this county does have a responsibility since it's approving projects to provide for the health and safety of the public. And at the time that the development is approved um, and the roads are considered, it's typically owned by a developer or a, a landowner and a developer in concert working on, on a project. And then later it belongs to a community of people, individuals, who didn't really have a vote in whether or not um, the road was private or public and whether they were willing to compromise. Now, granted, they could have bought someplace else, I suppose you can say, but um, the houses turn over and, and you can get some distance between the time and the factors that were in place when the decision was made and the time and the factors that are in place uh, when, when owners subsequently own it. And I think that's why the county has problems with people wanting the county to take over private roads because later the owners want the services that go with a public mm -hmm. road and and the standards that go with the public road. So I, I think it's kind of reminds me of our discussion of floodwaters and whether th we have a responsibility to think about the safety of the people who buy houses that are in a flood zone. Uh, it, it seems to me that we do have some responsibility to provide safe roads. Now, I don't know whether a 24-foot road is safer than a 22-foot road or not. I'm not a safety expert on roads, but um, I think that there is some legitimate role for the county to play in deciding if you're going to build a community that's going to serve subsequent owners, lots of them, what, this, what the standard of the road should be, whether it's public or private. Um. What are the basic differences between the standards for a private road and a public road? Uh, the private road section is uh, similar to the, the most, is similar in every way to the most basic initial public road standard uh, or minimal standard except it has a 16 foot wide tar and chip surface instead of a 20 foot wide but the base is of the sufficient width the, the 20 feet uh, because that is requested from the fire and rescue that there be 20 foot for them to drive up and down on so there's two basic lanes for them to get back and forth on so you've got a 20 foot base only 16 of which has to be paved 16 has to be paved and if, and if it was ever upgraded to a county road then you would only need to do it four additional feet of tar and chip before it will become a county standard. So it'll be a very simple and very easy upgrade to do. Could we go back just a little further? Uh, why, why, what is the benefit of increasing the number of residential dwelling units on a private road? Why do you want to do that? Uh, it's just to provide an option to, uh, to the public that I mean there are people in the public that do want to live on a private road and be more than five lots we get a request uh, typically our request f is for the road standard to be upgraded above and beyond what the county is willing to provide in a maintenance and replacement program I mean we do uh, hot mix asphalt or tar and chip uh, developers come in wanting to do all kinds of fancy things um, and we will simply will not consider those because of um, we can't afford to maintain those or replace those in the future. Um, so either they have to dumb down their design or they, um, they ha we have had cases where they have proceeded with that but done that under easement where it's a county road but that portion of it is spelled out very clearly that they have to maintain that perk or that upgrade in that area. So, so this allows a developer to design um, above and beyond our standard. Um, and, and, and they will maintain it. We simply can't afford to maintain them. Why don't you give Gibson's Grant? Gibson's Grant is an example. If you go into Gibson's Grant, when you drive in the entrance, you'll come across what you feel is a bridge. That's not a bridge. It's stamped, uh, I believe it's stamped concrete or stamped asphalt. Um, and that 
portion is a county road, but the maintenance of that is back on Gibson's grant to do that. We simply can't maintain that. Can you talk a little bit about the difference in uh, cost of maintaining, you know, what's happened to the county in terms of yeah, there's a, there, uh, As you may know, there's been a, uh, a lot of budget shortfalls over the past couple of years with the HUR funding being cut. Um, Highway user funds. Yes, that we get from the, if you don't know, the, the state basically collects money through uh, gasoline tax, new car sales, and gives that as a portion that out to each county um, and state and towns. And for the past, uh, we're going on our third year, that's been cut by 95%. Um, so we are... The, Queens County is sort of transitioning into um, where we were solely funded by state money to being uh, subsidized by the general fund and we're still waiting to hear if we're going to get any money for FY12 and how we're going to be funded. Basically what that means is we have 550 miles of road and we have no money to maintain it. So, so we certainly don't want to we don't we don't want to accept new roads because we're not given money to maintain those roads. We can't maintain the roads we currently have. So this is a cost uh, effort in terms of getting your costs down. Uh, what do you do when you have, let, let's move from a developer to uh, people buy lots and put, put up their own houses and you have a private road. What do you do when those citizens don't maintain the road? Whoever owns the road is responsible for maintaining it. We have a couple of roads down southern Kent Island that literally you cannot ride down. And it would seem to me it would be very hard for uh, ambulance or any kind of emergency vehicle mm -hmm. to get down them. Uh, are, are we creating a problem by having an open-ended, I mean, it just says more than five, there's no limit to it. Well, it would be a case, I think what we're talking about here is this, as the projects come in, it would be a case-by-case -case situation. And part of that would be some sort of documentation or covenants and that this road would be, well, of course, we'd have to go through the same bonding um, and the same designs, uh, meet or exceed our design standards, and it would be inspected for construction. But there would need some sort of covenants or documentation that there's a funding source available in that community, whether by the developer or the, or the residents of that community, to maintain that road. And whether that's a, a yearly homeowner association fee or, or, or however be funded to maintain that in perpetuity. Because if the county was called upon, if the roads did go, um, did become uh, in a state of disrepair and they wanted the county to take it over, they would first have to upgrade the roads or repair them to our standards before we would take them over. So um, when a private road moves to a county road, and you know the homeowners uh, decide we, we don't want the private road anymore and we want the county to take it over. Do you have a choice to say no? And you say we have 500 plus miles of road, we don't have any more money and we can't afford to take any more private roads and so you as a homeowner are going to be stuck on this road in disrepair? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So my concern uh, was that if we have a private road and the homeowners, um, you know, the development is maybe 10 homes or 25 homes. It doesn't really matter how large it is, but it's uh, more than five. And the homeowners decide we, we want the county to take over our road. Uh, and you're doing this as a cost-saving measure. But we as a planning commission approve this, knowing that it's not going to be a cost to you. But now the homeowners want you to take over the road, and it ends up being a cost to you then we're, we're not all working in sync, moving in the same direction at keeping the costs of our county responsible. Yes, and I, and I think uh, Mr. Drummond would, would agree that we've certainly seen that in the past, and um, I've done four private road upgrades in Southern Ken Island. Um, but I think what we're talking about here are projects where... And who paid for those? The citizens on the road paid for okay. those. They had frontage yeah. on those roads. Great. Um, but I think they're, what we're talking about here is... Um, people who are buying into these communities would buy into them with their eyes wide open understanding what what they were buying there are some people that do want to live in a private community that they can gate off that they can yeah. they can do that I, i'm very much in favor of that um, i just want to make sure that it's not ultimately going to fall back on all of the taxpayers of our county there is the, the, as far as i know there's never been a case where the taxpayers okay. paid for a road upgrade yep. the citizens are and we have had roads that you're right uh I don't know if an ambulance or fire truck could get down it. Uh, buses, school buses won't go down. Mail will not be delivered. And they have contacted us, and there's simply nothing we can do until they, as a community, get together and, and can fund the project. I think you've talked about conditions that makes a lot of sense in terms of providing security that the road will be maintained 
under some set of standards, I don't know what those would be, um, and that sort of thing, but I don't see that, any of that in the conditions for approval. Well, there is language in there for the there covenants. Are, it's up, there's a, other sections for private road covenants. Oh, okay, so they're already in the... Yeah. And, and, and I supplied those last month um, that talk but about... Um, different section of Title 18. Yeah. Under D, requirements, let me read those to you. I don't think... Uh, change, uh, we haven't had any trouble with private roads in, that have been built in the last 20 years, have we? You haven't had to take over any of those. Um, there's been some smaller ones up north um, and more east in the county, and they are, <laughs> they kind of came to uh, to a head after the blizzard. It was snow oh, removal. Thought, they oh, couldn't I get thought. snow removal. Uh, the roads actually for, we were very fortunate, and the, the private road standard was such that the cost to upgrade it and take it over was minimal. We had to go in, clean the road up, maybe shoot it with tar and chip, um, widen out a little bit, but it was a relatively Quite low large cost. private roads that have been approved in the last 20 years, though, are yeah. I think not you're a gonna, lot of complaining from, from home No, No, you're going to find that, in, in, for the most part, if, if it's not set up properly, you, you'll find that um, citizens learn quickly that the cost to, of maintenance of infrastructure is very expensive, and I think that's why most individually do become county. I think the projects we're talking about here would would uh, supersede that type of stuff, and you would really be seeing very high-end communities coming in wanting to remain private. But you, mentioned, a, like a, you mentioned that it's high-end communities that would want this, and you mentioned that Gibson Grant is a good example of that. There must We don't have this law now. There must be some mechanism in the existing law that allows you to let a high-end community be developed with it's high-end roads. Well, that's that's the, um, number two. The growth area. It says good. it is permitted under on under. And I guess one districts? under one of the plan. Uh, and I I have a typo there. I apologize. Of the master plan district. Right. So Gibson's grant grant is Chester um, Master Plan Development CMPD. So um, I think specifically permitted in there. there. There are plenty of examples of nice communities that had private roads that went bad. Prospect Bay, Queen Anne Colony, when I started in real estate business 27 years ago, they were pretty crappy, and they all <laughs> upgraded. Um, the Kent Island States and Romacoke situation is they're trying to maintain roads on a $20 a year fee per lot, which was appropriate in 1940 and is no longer appropriate, and if they charged everybody enough money, then they wouldn't have the problem that they have. But obviously those people who live on those roads that are in lousy condition would prefer to live on that road than pay the money. Uh, or, or they can't pay the money, but that you know, all we're talking about here is: Are we going to give people the option of building a private road, or are we going to, to require them to build a county spec road that has to be open to the public and be pretty much the same standard, except for four feet of pavement? This is not a cost-saving thing. This is not going to allow more development than already is allowed. This is simply going to give people the option of building a private road that the county doesn't have to pay to maintain. Quite frankly, I don't think very many people are going to take that option, but if they do, I say more power to them. Is this saving the developer money also? I would say it would, be, it would well, the developer, I would say it would cost the community more money in the long run. I mean, they have to, they, they the have to attract a certain... The only between a public road and a private road is four feet of paving, yeah. right? Uh, I'm just yes by the standard by the five lots yes right. so that's what we got today that's what this is not going to change is that four feet of asphalt or four feet of right. tar and chip the road base is the same as a public road a, or a private road. under this if you if you were more than okay. five lots you would do a county road standard so really it would be no cost savings to anybody except someone's going to have to pay to maintain it and and plow the snow and, so and things it's like not, that. So it's not cheaper for a developer to no. go in and say, okay, it's the citizen's responsibility to take care of these roads. It's not mine as a developer to put it in in the first place. No, not, it would not be cheaper for a developer to... No, the standard does not lessen. <coughs> the standard is going to remain the same in the future if this, if this goes through as it is now. We're not... We're not dumbing down the standard. It, and, the, and the design standard will meet the, the design accordingly based on the number of lots. Okay. The uh, initiative for this amendment, did it come from a particular developer wanting a particular thing? No. 
This is from DPW because they don't have any money. Yeah, I, I, I understand, about. but it was suggested <laughs> earlier by a citizen. I'm just trying to clarify for the benefit as of the As I citizen, mentioned before, we've had, we've had several requests um, for higher-end products than we can maintain. <coughs> Gibson's Grant is the example of that. Now, most of the roads in Gibson's Grant are county roads. There are some private, but we have worked out a sort of a patchwork of easements where it's a county road, but they have to maintain parts of it because we simply could not, we, we, we simply could not take that on in our maintenance program. Take. Excuse me. What was, excuse me. Okay. If I may uh, address Mary's question um, directly. Yeah, we were asked in the Droder subdivision that the Planning Commission recently reviewed and approved a private or a public road on. Um, the question was, um, can we do this as a private road because we're creating this own small community? It's kind of exclusive. If we did it as condominiums, we could do it on our own and it wouldn't need to be a public road. Um, that's not the product ultimately that came through. And we told them the current law is that if you want to build more than five units, you have to do a public road. And that's what came through and was approved by the Planning Commission. Now, the other side of that is with the current budget cuts, the um, elimination of highway user revenue, the uh, reduction in workforce out at public works. The question is, what does that new public road add to our public road inventory? On a short road like that, where people can easily get out to the public road, mail service at the public road, bus stop at the public road, um, it made sense, you know, and it could make sense, especially on a short road like that. It adds not very much to the um, county road inventory. We don't get additional revenue from it. Um, it doesn't add anything to our inventory other than maintenance cost. So, yeah, that, that, that discussion that we were asked, could is that possible? And our answer was no, you have to come through as a public road. Um, but, um, and... Then we also evaluated or started looking at in our master plan development districts, you could make that request. And that request is a request before the planning commission, which the planning commission has the discretion to say yes or no. It's, it's not a given that because they ask for it, they'll get it. Um, and so should that, would that make sense to expand to other zoning districts? And that's really what this, you know, kind of request is. So you're saying in the master plan district, that discretion is already there? Yes. Um, and, we have um, Ellendale, Four Seasons, Gibson's Grant. The different projects came through, um, and each of those had different requests or could request different road standards um, as well as a, a mix or a all public, all private request. So this amendment it would be for our areas outside of the master plan yes. district? Yeah. The master plan development districts are all in growth areas on public water and sewer and allow a lot of latitude in the layout design bulk standards all of which were are approved by the planning commission um, this it would just allow a an option of review by the planning commission to to make it public or private and the only difference we're talking about between public and private as far as the road standards is four feet of tar and chip or that's I guess just to address Mrs. Tolliver's concerns, I'd like to read the requirements or just go over them briefly because this is all in section 18189, private roads created after um, November 8, 1987. These are the requirements. In improving any private road that is found to be permissible under the provisions of this section, the Planning Commission shall impose at a minimum the requirements specified in this subsection. Technical standards for a private show road shall comply with technical standards in Chapter 23. Any approved private road shall clearly be marked private road on the final subdivision plat. Um, the, the fact that the road is private is not a responsibility of any agency or department of the county shall be part of the covenants. The intersection at the private road with any county or state road or highway shall be posted on the sign indicating the road is private and the public maintenance ends at the intersection of the proposed private road and the county and state road. Provisions shall be made in the covenants that the maintenance of such signs and repair of replacement of signs at the request of the county. The covenants shall clearly state the county will not assume any portion of the cost of upgrading the private roads to a public standard. All covenants authorized un or under this subsection shall be in the form of required by Chapter 18 and shall be approved as a form and legal sufficiency by the attorney of the Planning Commission. 
you know, um, and I think that's what you were talking about. How, how are all, what are the requirements? So the requirements refer back to chapter 23, and, and I actually have chapter 23 in here, but so we, we wanted to make sure that, um, that those requirements were already in there. I didn't need to restate them. Okay. What, what do we want to do? Oh, yeah. No, okay, Sorry. yeah. Comment from the public. Thank you. I, uh, Barry Griffith, Lane Engineering. I had not intended to speak, but um, we, we, I do have interest in this text amendment. Uh, we do a lot of rural subdivisions, and there were a couple of uh, issues that I thought might help you in your decision. Number one, there is a difference if you can have a private road versus a public road in how... Um, ownership is handled of the of the road base a private road can be fee simple owned by the farm underneath it uh, what that means is that it's not going to be dedicated to the county it stays part of the farm so if you're doing a private road to get to lots a cluster of subdivisions in a corner of the farm and you need to run that road back to those lots you can actually Z ownership across that with pieces of the farm and you don't automatically or, or inadvertently have to subdivide the farm. Whereas if it were a public road, right away, the, whatever, however that dissected the portions of the farm would become completely separate parcels and have to count as a lot. And the other uh, consideration is that, so I think, I think it's good if you, can, if you can have more flexibility with the private roads. Um, the Department of Public Works, uh, generally, when you think that uh, of a five lot maximum, you're thinking of uh, a rural road going back to five new lots. Well, the interpretation of the Department of Public Works is actually, in most cases, everything is counted that touches that private road right away. So you may have a flag Porsche fee simple portion of for a farm coming out to the road to get back to the farm and you're going to do a cluster subdivision on that farm and you want to create a road down that flag portion a private road and use that that as the right of way for the private road they're going to count the farm on either side of that right of way even though legally those farms have no um, ability to access that but because it joins and touches they count it. So that really limits, you can't even do five new lots sometimes because of that interpretation. So I, I, again, I, I would just support the, uh, the flexibility with the, with the private roads. I think you'll end up with some better, uh, some better rural subdivision design if you do that. In a case like that, that you've described on the farm, uh, is it the, the farmer who retains the ownership of the farm who's responsible for the maintenance of the road? Um, it, it's normally set up through a, a, a system of covenants, as, as Helen was talking about, as to who's going to be responsible for maintenance of the road. And in most cases, it's going to be uh, an equal share distribution of the, of, the, of, the, of the lot owners. So usually, if you build five houses on the end, on a corner of a farm, you're saying that the five residents or owners of those, of those five properties also typically are responsible for the maintenance on the uh, flag driveway that comes in and, front, through the farm. And in that case... Even though they're not the... Even though it, the farm, you know... It, in that case, the farmer also is a party to the agreement as, as being responsible for maintenance and as, as maybe one, one fifth. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments from the public? Okay. What what do we want to do? I would move that we uh, give a favorable recommendation. Second. Board discussion. All in favor, aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Okay, motion's passed. We'll forward this with a favorable recommendation. Thank you all very much. Okay. Um, uh, I think we're to the point on renewable energy, right? Yeah. Do you, do uh, you want to take a break? Or? I know. Well, I know that uh, 
representative on this has another commitment. Is that still correct? Yeah, I have an election board. It has an 11 o'clock meeting. Okay. Sorry. Can we just move ahead and mm -hmm. take care of this? I have to go. Thank you very much. Okay. And this is the last one, Barry. So He's answering. Go plant your corn. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment, if I might, thank the chairman for having called me yesterday about the change in the, in the agenda. That was very courteous and kept me from having to sit here and cost me probably an hour of billable time, but I, I did very much. Well, I didn't know if you would be mad at me or happy. <laughs> you know, I, 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 that was very courteous to think of that, and I, and I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, great. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, um, this text amendment, which was um, introduced on behalf of a client of Mr. Thompson's as a citizen-sponsored text amendment last month, um, was tabled again by all of you um, at, at the request of staff um, because of significant changes that were felt needed to um, address the issue of renewable energy. In the course of that, um, I, I sent you a memo uh, last week and asked for your indulgence as I developed a more comprehensive review of, of what we would like to do is to limit this um, text amendment to only address solar energy. Uh, renewable energy includes um, other sources of um, energy and I was not at a, a point to be able to develop um, standards for that, and I'd like to defer that to the Comprehensive Plan Code update to address other means of um, renewable energy. To that effect, um, I asked Mr. Thompson, again, at, we, we discussed this, but I will say that he hasn't had the full um, ability to review everything that was developed in this uh, text amendment change. So I will defer to Mr. Thompson um, to make any and all comments that he possibly can because this is on behalf of his client. And um, But when I reviewed this, I felt that there needed to be additional standards for conditional use of allowing it to be permitted. Um, and um, I had an opportunity to be at a conference last week um, where they had two major presentations on renewable energy and solar energy, and I was able to get some assistance from Washington County, Frederick County, and um, we pulled some some information from Northampton, Virginia, all who, of whom have enacted um, new legislation concerning solar energy. Um, Washington County has really embarked on a huge effort to um, <coughs> convert their buildings and everything to solar, so I've, I was really impressed with their information. So, without further ado, um, the objective is to make this a solar energy. Um, I've added new definitions for solar energy, non-governmental utility, solar array, and solar collection system. I felt these were important um, to add to our definitions because we refer to them, we will be referring to them in the code or in the, in the other sections in terms of renewable uh, the standards. Um, so to that effect, solar energy is en energy generated by the sun that is infinite or constantly renewed. Non-governmental utility, any utility not owned by a governmental agent, uh, entity. Facilities include all buildings, structures, and land used to house the utility and equipment, including substations for transforming, boosting, or switching purposes, regulators, stationary um, transformers, and other such devices for supplying electric service, telephone offices, radio and television transmitted towers and stations, storage yards, and other ground pipelines. This is really inclusive. Um, and again, um, I think... Can I ask why? what's the point of the definition? Because I don't see that, that that appears anywhere. Well, the point is to say that it's well, I mean, it's it's to define it as a non-governmental utility. I understand that, but mm -hmm. why is that significant when that that phrase "non-governmental utility" isn't in the thing? Yeah. You're right. Is that the use that we're trying to allow as a conditional use? Well, no, we're trying to allow solar energy facilities, and we're trying to say that they're and maybe in the definition I should put solar energy facilities that are non-governmental utilities or something like that. Okay, I just wondered what No, you're the you're point right. I I actually put that in afterwards when I right. after I wrote the standards because I I was thinking that I don't I, I don't think we should be regulating governmental en entities <coughs> that do 
um, there was a distinguishing point from the Public Service Commission about non-governmental utility as opposed to governmental utility. So I think, thank you, Chris. That's a good point. This is a work in progress. Right. Should, let, should let facilities make a be point. a separate definition from non-governmental utility? It's really defining the They're facility, really right? Two. I think I'm more Chris. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm hoping it is, but. Okay. Let, let me make a point. Uh, I'm at the point that this is such an extensive change, <laughs> change I know. that our agenda today is not to adopt or deny. I, agree. Uh, I think we need to uh, request an extension okay. and work on it, but I think that our purpose today should be to discuss it for clarity so that Thank we you. can get it out <laughs> and let the public and everybody else have a chance at it. I mean, this is a pretty extensive document here. Um, and, and you know, based on my reading of it, I think it's a pretty good document. But uh, I think we need more time for the public and ourselves to look at it. So on, on that context, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's go ahead and ask questions and so well, forth. Well, shouldn't, shouldn't the, maybe the title be uh, facilities and then, the, then any uh, facilities of a non-governmental utility or uh, of a utility not owned by a government entity including and then the things that you've included there as opposed to showing it as a definition of a non-governmental utility. Isn't it really a definition of a solar facility including but not limited to? I mean, you're probably going to want to catch all in case you forgot something and I think it's an all-inclusive but who knows what else. Uh -huh. but yeah. I think we're saying the same whatever thing. You, where Christmas whatever going, you call like this thing. Okay. Well, the is going to show up in the use table. Right. S starts off that, saying those two don't. S matter. says solar energy facilities. Right. So if you put solar energy facilities where you have non-government utility, then I think that reads okay, doesn't it? Okay. Because that the S is your major heading, solar energy facilities. Mm -hmm. And then that has to go up in here in the use okay. table. Okay. Yeah. And the solar collection system definition? Yeah, that's not that a includes a, that's that includes the that's array. not a definition. That's a that's a regulation. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to add that um, as and um, because um, and I, I I pulled this because I really wanted to um, allow and I don't know if we don't allow solar collection systems on this is says in all it shall be permitted in all. Um, zoning districts on roof or exterior walls and stru or structures. I think it is. Cur currently, they're permitted as accessory to a residential. Right. Okay, so that I don't um, need that. Here, right. we're um, specifically looking at generation for right. power. I don't need that. Um, then. Not for uh, um, an individual use, but to power greater than the property at all. No, I don't need that. Yeah, commercial. Yeah, commercial. Yeah. Isn't that what they just done down east? That building yeah. before we get to east, and they put off. Acre ground, acre and a half ground. It's a solar array. A solar array. <laughs> right. Do you like that lovely, lovely uh, display down there? Yeah, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to, well, anyway. Um, okay, so I just. need a definition for, if there's something different between a solar array and a solar collection system, you need a definition. Presumably a solar collection right, system. Right, system is a solar array. No. Presumably it's something that's not on the ground. Right. A solar collection system is a building-mounted collection right, system. Right, exactly. And a solar okay. array is a ground-mounted collection system. If that's what's intended here, or are they all solar? I mean, I think they, they're they're the, different, and that's right. Well, you um, have to be careful there because your solar array definition includes solar collection system as a description. So, yeah. but and some of the collection systems aren't different. aren't mounted. Right, well, they See, aren't that's mounted, and this is saying they're mounted. mounted. I mean, some are standalone, particularly on, let's say, a multi-purpose residential. I mean, right. you could have a, a you know a four-unit facility that might have a standalone array, not physically attached. So, a solar array is ground mounted. Well, and that's what it's at, and. The definition of a solar collection system is building mounted. Well, I might probably don't want to say that then. I right. probably want to say a solar collection system is one that is, um, I probably need to define it. Because a solar collection system, which could be a solar array, is, is a solar array permitted in the zoning district. Is it the intent what Steve just pointed out? I think the solar collection system, regardless of where mounted, isn't being put in for commercial purposes. It's being put in to 
power or something that's on that on on a on the same site. Yeah, we, we were it's not for sale. Um, well, I mean, the request that the department has been receiving is to um, allow uses that would be further regulated or initially regulated by the Public Service Commission for the generation of power. Um, the Droder subdivision you had that came in that may have some panels on individual houses, that's dealt with through permitting issues and is permitted. Um, if you had, um, you know, a, a panel serving a small community, that is probably even accessory to the community and would be permitted. Um, it's really when you get into power generation for the sale and at the Public Service Commission, which we're trying to address, because we've had requests for, um, can we do 100 acres of solar panels? Um, the state is making initiatives. The state has a, a, a commitment to, I believe it's 20% of its power through renewable resources by 2020. Oh, yeah. um, that's there's, gonna happen. Yeah, there's breaks. Um, well, there, there's incentives out there, and I think that's helping to generate the interest and make Maryland uh, one of the more attractive places to, to bring these uses. Um, and so th that, which, you know, makes sense to why we're getting the request, you know. Um, so there, there, that, I think that is the target. Tax and, so and I, I do appreciate Helen's um, effort. We were trying to definitely try to move forward as many tax amendments as possible yeah. now. Um, I appreciate the Planning Commission moving um, all the citizen-sponsored tax amendments forward, um, as well as the other one to implement the comp plan from last month with Ag and Countryside and the Roads tax amendment, um, recognizing, you know, this one, um, we just need a little more time on yeah. it. It's <laughs> not ready for prime right. time. So, and, um, um, but, uh, there's an analogy to, to what you just mentioned, Stephen. We've done this in one or two subdivisions, as I recall, I think, uh, approved it. And that is an underground, yeah, generally an underground natural gas tank that then um, supplies natural gas to the houses in the subdivisions. That would be the same thing as a solar panel mm -hmm. that's providing energy to the ho homes in the subdivision. We did that with we, Gibson's for, Grant. Okay. They have an underground um, tank that supplies natural gas, um, and that's in a master plan community. Um, oh, so. uh, there's a, one or two of those tanks underground in a cluster subdivision out in the hinterlands. So mm -hmm. same thing as having a solar panel. Or a geothermal. You could, you could yeah. do it for a multi purpose. Yeah, so that, that's what Steve's talking about. This is for... for this uh, is for sale purposes. For sale back to the grid. And the purpose of the creation of these panels is purely for selling electricity um, to the power companies that's being generated. Well, well that doesn't... 20, 30, 40, 100 acres, 200 acres. I understand I mean, that, but that doesn't... I'm, let's assume that the um, solar array that we've all seen down by the ice rink in Easton, let's assume that all that's doing is supplying energy to the ice rink. That's what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, that under this circumstance, under this proposal, would be permitted in any zoning district. Is, it, is that what we want? Well, I think you're saying it's already already permitted, permitted, right? That's what I'm hearing. Doesn't yeah. it need to be well, mounted on the building? Well, no. No, no that would no. Our current interpretation of the code is that um, an accessory use, if it's accessory to um, the use on the property, it would be permitted. And uh, the that example we haven't had to deal with at no, this but, point but um, we can we now we've seen it so we yeah. probably should deal with it is that sure. but absolutely could, but couldn't you deal with it under your already under your site plan review process i mean that should have been subject i don't know what he did but wouldn't it have been subject let me to let me back up if um we have had know. the requests of um, we have chicken houses and we're looking into wind energy to power them or solar energy to power chicken houses i mean uh, structurally i don't think it works but you have these large you know, spanses of roof line um, that, you know, if, if built could support a large number of panels. Um, we would consider a windmill accessory to a farm mm -hmm. to generate the power to serve the chicken houses. Um, a solar panel on a house would be accessory to the house to power the house, um, those types of things. Right now, we'd probably take the interpretation that it would be accessory. Um, there is questions, um, and some of uh, what Helen put together was to, to try to get to what is constitutes lot coverage or impervious coverage. You know, on a pedestal, um, you know, some of the requirements was to make sure grass continued to grow underneath and could be maintained and that type of stuff. Um, so I think there are um, some of those issues. And the type of solar panels. Um, <coughs> Are going to t can probably continue to evolve, and the efficiency of them is going to continue to evolve. This is kind of where we were with uti the utility of a tower 
you know, a tower is a utility. Um, originally, they were radio towers way back when, and then when cell phones were invented, all of a sudden, there were different issues that we had to deal with and come up with different regulations for. I think we're on the front end of that now, and we're going to have to pay attention to how they evolve and adjust our regulations over time. Um, I think Chris's point is really valid. Uh, is there any way to have some photographs of the uh, uh, structure down at Easton so we can have a better idea of what we're talking about here? You see it, Jeff? I hear it's not what? very. Pleasant. Well, I think um, <laughs> the buffering standards is something. I think no, um, no, that's an understatement. The ones in Talbot County have just gone in. I don't know if there's buffering standards there. I don't know if they're actually don't want the buffering there to have it as a display project. Mm -hmm. They have a public, sign out there. Since it's public property. Um, but the height and the size of the um, solar panels certainly would play into the height and the width of the buffer. Um, mm -hmm. We've, uh, If you look online, you can see a wide variety of what these panels could look like um, up to um, the, what Easton would have or what um, a flat panels held at an angle. Some would rotate to follow the sun. Some would stay stationary. Some would be, you know, they've I've seen pictures of them in the form of satellite dishes, you know, in <laughs> very different arrays. Um, so we, I think, are looking at something more consistent with what a people, what what you know, we've seen in Easton, a series of long panels and, and long lines um, on a piece of property that may rotate to follow the sun. That's kind of what we're. Um, classifying height limits is something that, um, um, but there's a lot of resources out there to pull from, and, and Helen's uh, been trying to get a hold of them. Uh, she has worked with some of them. She's gotten a lot of good information in the last month since her last meeting. Um, I think if we can get some guidance as to a direction and some some comments, we'll continue to work on it and try to make it put it in an approvable state in the very near future. Well, we've talked about definitions here. Are there any other concerns that anyone came up with in the uh, in the body of the of the text? Well, the purpose and intent section um, I, that needs to be uh, massaged a little bit because if it's a is to establish guidelines, really it should be conditions because it's conditionally used for the siting of solar, let me take some words out, Okay. of solar collection systems that manage or store power. That, that's the, uh, that could be read to mean the one that's on the roof of a house. So we're, uh, do you want to make that a conditional uh, use? No. If you're going to change the definition of the solar energy well, the facilities, problem, it just needs to be massaged because what the goal here is to get after the last part of it, which is a solar collection system that's used to transmit power to the electric grid. Right. So that needs a little massaging. Okay. But if you do, as you pointed out, the chairman did to change this definition, this non-governmental to solar energy facilities, could to the purpose of the section of establishing the guidelines for siting solar energy facilities that right. then right. do okay. that. And then it all kinds of right. okay. so that, Now you have to be careful of that too because some of these home things are hooked to the grid. They are. And some small amount goes back to the grid. Really. They get a credit for it. Yeah. Uh -huh. But what it is though, but it says going to the grid, you've got to say that that's the sole purpose or something like that. Well, what happens, though, is my understanding from the discussions I heard is that what you do is you get an ongoing credit from your from the um, electric company that just they you build in a credit. And then so you you what you're doing is it's like having a credit card and they you know, they the, the energy you're generating that goes back to them, they just credit it against your use. And I'm not sure that you actually get any cash for it in the long no, run. No, I just don't think you get, do. It so might be the commercial purpose that will generate. It's, it's somewhere in here. It might, mean, we might have to, that, say, that this is regulating the commercial application, not right. the... I think that's what the non-governmental utility was, was trying, trying to, to do. To get to, <laughs> and, and I think um, that puts it in a different category than the homeowner. It puts it in a different category yeah. than the, the, the commercial. smaller. Maybe yeah, that's smaller. the phrase that needs to be in that commercial. Well, let, let me ask this then. Does... <laughs> I got to think of an example. Say, um, I'm 
Board of Education decides it wants to heat and cool Queen Anne's, you know, that's in the town. No, Queen Anne's County High School with solar panels. They're going to need at least as many solar panels for the high school as there's down to the community center in, um, in Easton. Mm -hmm. That's permitted. Well, without any. No I wouldn't say no, that that no would be permitted without a site plan. Uh, accessory structures, if it, if it comes. There's no site plan required for that. Impervious. Well, the yeah, determination the, would need to be made if it's additional impervious. Um, and okay, let's say it is. Yeah. Okay. So they come in for a site plan, and they say we're going to build, we're we're going to heat this high school. It's going to take us three acres of solar panels, <laughs> and so we're just going to, you know, you got to approve this because there's no. Uh, regulation of it, and we're going to put a. Uh, we like this chain link the fence fences. that is around the one down in Talbot County, and that's what we're going to do. And we'll tear up a little bit of the. So we'll tear up the soccer field, and there it is. They already have the chain link fence. <laughs> that's true. They do. <laughs> <laughs> Brand new. I'm, I'm not <laughs> advocating. I'm not advocating <laughs> yes. regulations of it. Uh, I'm pointing uh, out that there are none. I, I would for say that yes, circumstance. Ju just as um, windmills would go up on farms, and yes, I would say say currently, um, we would look at it as structures that are accessory to the principal use. I'm, I'm just pointing it out. That's all. Yeah. No. I, I. I. Well, and I agree. It's. It's those types of things that our code does not address that is why we believe it needs some attention now um, and especially for the the commercial entities um, wasn't this proposal brought to us by the Prince George's County Rod and Real Club or something Rod and, Rod and Gun Club that's correct are they do would they be would, they're not a commercial entity are they they've been approached to, to put the to facilities sell. to sell, to put the facilities in by an, an energy group. So, and, I, and I've got four different clients who have been. So, uh, what, I guess if they're, but if they are essentially, would they be selling their property or would they be doing it on behalf of the commercial entity? All of selling the energy. Everything I have looked at has been a, Everything yeah. I have looked at has been a lease. Well, I think we need to be careful about defining then so that it's broad enough to incorporate entities that are not necessarily commercial but that are serving a commercial purpose um, I think uh, then we need to say that it's the use it's the use you're regulating though not not who's yeah, doing so, it yeah. so whether the property owner is doing it or a commercial well, think, entity but when if you were selling it you were talking about a definition that li limited this to commercial right Wouldn't so it would be case. commercial regardless Zoning, in my mind, regulates use is not necessarily, right. you know, so it would regulate it whether or not it was the property owner, say, selling to a Delmarva, like I might do on my farm, or whether somebody comes to me to lease my farm. It's the use that would be regulated. I think you've got that covered. That's just... Okay. Chris, what do you think? Well, we... Uh, I agree with what everybody said. It, it, oh, that's, that's definitive. That, uh, that I'm not me sure... Too. I, I'm not sure that... <laughs> I'm not sure that we have a, a, a definition of the use we're trying to regulate. That's the problem. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I think. And, it, I, I've, I, and I can't disagree. I've got trouble with even solar array. I don't even know what a linked photovoltaic module is. So. Can't even pronounce <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I know so, what it is because so, I've seen it. So, okay, okay, and okay, that's yes. what they call those when you link different panels together. They call it an array. But and but that's do we want to limit it that way? I mean, if it's well, I want to. I, I guess what I want to do is. Um, no, we don't want to limit it. I want to make sure I cover all my bases. We don't want to have to come back every in. time. All of a sudden, it's not a photovoltaic module. Know, it's something else. Well, we can make it much more general. I just um, was thinking that I don't want to miss the term of art that someone might come in with. That it's I easy for understand. me to throw arrows. I know so. No, no. I, 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 don't, mean, so I don't mean that this. in any way. So. <laughs> 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 Oh, yeah. all this a lot of that is regulated at a different level than right. us right yeah we're looking at land use we're going to look at buffers we're going to look at height limits we're going to look at setbacks um, the stuff that the Public Service Commission would dictate when you become a certain level you know we can use that as a gauge on when somebody's a certain size but we don't need to regulate some of the things they're already involved in so we will try to figure out where those cutoffs are um, I think this discussion has also generated um, a category of if there's more than a certain number of panels for yeah. a large commercial use is something that we probably need to look at and, and address as well. I think we also, even if it's a non-profit use. I think we need to look at the uh, 
what we think is currently permitted and maybe have some kind of limitations on that as far as but when does it number not, when does it not so accessory what? The, yeah. well I think that's a, a, a line we have to draw right. and um, we will uh, work on that. Um, let's work on that part of it also. Yeah. In addition um, to the commercial, let's take a look at what we. Yeah. I would do think what it moves allow. off site would be the logical. No, but we we have a school that has 141 acres, um, um, most of which I would say 100 isn't used for anything at the high school. You know, um, significant amount of land that they can yeah. use. And, and the question <laughs> is, we're going to look at. Are there other lines they would cross by other regulatory entities? Right. Would that be looked at differently, or would they be generating a surplus or self-sufficient than um, um, an individual homeowner? Yeah. Right. Well, now that I have the connections, I very much would like to have some of these professionals come in. I mean, I have some pictures, but at the bottom it says confidential and proprietary. <laughs> and Let I, me see and, those. And I, and I, and I, and I have, and although my clients haven't signed the agreements, they have confidentiality provisions. So I'm really leery about starting hand in hand. No, no, no. up. So but I very much would like them to come and invite them to come because I think you're going to set the standard not only for Queen Anne's County, but very likely the other adjoining counties that they're also going to come and um, try to approach. So we might, I, I'm like you, let's not do it now. Let's take some time. I, I've got some concerns over, you know, the, the height limitations that are in here just generally. Uh, the vegetation that might go under those those units. If you have to have vegetation, I don't want to have to hire midgets to cut the grass. I mean, you know, there's there's all there's. No, it says small it has children. to be four feet. I mean, feet. there's some of the. I mean, some but it says four feet so that you. Well, can that's what I mean. It has to be a midget. I mean, I can't. <laughs> I mean, how are you? There are maintenance issues here that I want to address. I could get small children to do a job and. Um, the intention was that you could <laughs> put a uh, yeah, there's vegetation other than grass, <laughs> right? <laughs> but there is, and I think we need to address all those things. And I and I'd like to have someone in the field, you know, help us address it. And, and that, we'll, that's all I'm saying. We and, would ask that we do that um, uh, in, in the next 30 days, so we have something meaningful to bring back to the planning yeah. commission. I'll try we'll to try make to an effort to set up a meeting with this group is the one we have the most faith in. They seem to have the most experience. I'll try to set up a meeting between uh, they and Helen and I, okay. and then maybe okay. have them even appear before you to answer whatever questions you might have, Chris. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing that I very much appreciate that Helen put in, and you can tell I'm not representing one of the companies, I'm truly representing the landowner who has interests that are very similar to yours, is this bonding requirement. Um, I would ask that it even be stronger than the way that, that, that Helen's written it. Um, my biggest concern, and even negotiating, and you've saved me all this negotiating if you put it in a law, is that I very much want my client protected. I mean, it could be that 10 years from now with a pen, of, you know, something larger than the head of my, you know, pen, that they can generate the same amount of electricity they can with 100 acres of solar power panels, and then I've got some LLC that has no, financial backing that just walks away and leaves us with this hundred acres in the field. So I very much want it and and when I say stronger, I think it ought to be revisited on an annual or a biannual basis by the planning office so that if some part of the power were to be determined to be, you know, a, a hazardous waste, the bonding that might be put in place in year one might not be sufficient in, in year three. So that's just something that I've been trying to get to negotiate with these companies and it's been very difficult. They will say, well, in year 15 we'll do it. Well, you know, the trouble is you might be going in year five. So I think they need to bond right out of the gate. The bonding's not that expensive. Um, the problem with most of these companies is not, it's not a question of the price of the bond. They don't have the collateral to post yeah. to get the bond. Yeah. So, but, but if they don't, then I don't want to do business with them and I, and I don't know that the county should do business with them. Okay. Now, a month from now, I'll probably be representing some power company telling you to just go. <laughs> You'll be speaking as the other side of the mouth. <laughs> I'm so glad you put that on the record. <laughs> I'm on television. Yeah, you're on television, too. I mean, you know. Has the APA weighed in with any model ordinances yet? Not that I know of. Um, but I will, I will do a research. This, um, the, as I said, um, this was kind of cobbled together a little bit. I will say that Washington County only allows you to, doesn't allow you to store electricity. It only allows you to sell to the grid. And I didn't mm -hmm. want to restrict that. Storage is the hugest issue with, with, with um, renewable energy, is that um, the, the cells are not, they've not come up with um, um, cells that adequately store 
um, for a long period of time energy, and that it can be. Um, and the real issue with that I heard mostly was that um, this energy is intermittent. Um, you know, the sun is shining or it's not. The wind is blowing or it's not. So, and you can't have surges going into your system. So you need to. You need to. They have to convert it from DC to. You're getting much more information than you need. But <laughs> I'm just saying that there's just lots of issues. And it's just like. I think what we need now is uh, a motion to ask for an extension from the commissioners. And How long? Do you want to? Um, and. Ninety days. Uh, is well, that um. Is that appropriate? Well. It, it, Planning Commission does have a few options. One, they could make an unfavorable on the citizen text amendment as it came in. Right. Um, and then work with staff on a new ordinance to put together to move forward with the cooperation of the agent. Um, the other is ask for an extension. 90 days. Um, the goal of the department is to wrap up these citizen sponsored text amendments, um, which I'm, I'm saying that so if we do keep this one pending, which is fine with. Uh, the staff in the department that we try to move through it in a quick um, um, manner to resolve it in the next couple months to put an ordinance forward um, because the main goal of what of where the department is is to move forward with the comprehensive update of the zoning ordinance let We've me raise a, let me raise a point here okay. yep. if we keep this one open and work on it then the text amendment is at the discretion of the presenter and at any point in time they can withdraw it if we do an unfavorable recommendation get that one off the table and the planning commission starts working on one then it's at our discretion yeah mm -hmm. uh, and if they would withdraw it we can still do we could still come back and we can, do one. We can just take where we left off and move forward. We could do that. Yeah, that yes, would we be so, that. So would be good. So there's no... We have a 90-day extension. Yeah, uh, I think a 90-day... And, and that gives us... It uh, doesn't mean that we can't conclude it earlier if, we, if we're prepared to do that. But um, just as the county commissioners advertise a tax increase higher than they may want to make, yeah. I think we need to ask for 90 days. It's, it's a complex issue and we may be pioneers in some respects. I don't have any problem with the, with the 90 days. Like Steve's pointing out, we can probably do it in less, but you don't want to have to keep going back to the well. Right. Um, I would like to say that I don't have any problem with the fundamental change that, that Helen suggested, that, that be being taken out the hydro and the wind. Um, I just added that. I was really hired to do the solar. I just thought, let's have the discussion. So I added it in. So I did want to point out. No, we don't no have any basic uh, disagreements that we're working on here. We're just trying to get the thing pulled together in the best possible way. And the way. reason I like to go forward with this is that my client knows that I'm a part of the process. Okay. To be fair. Okay. Okay. So. Well, I have a motion. You have a motion. You need a second. Need a second. second. Okay. All in favor, aye. 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 Okay, so we'll ask for a 90 day extension. And, uh, Appreciate it again. You give me eight minutes to get up down. Yep, you got time to get up down. <laughs> okay. I think that's all of the agenda, right? Do we have any more miscellaneous staff items? Yeah. Um. I just just to follow up on what I was saying, we are trying to wrap some things up. The Planning Commission's completed their recommendations on rezonings, completed their recommendations on um, uh, most of the citizen-sponsored text amendments today. Um, we'll be moving those forward. The Graysonville plan's pending at the county commissioner level, and hopefully they'll move that forward soon. Um, they've held the public hearing on it. Um, we're trying to wrap up some of those things so that we can move forward with the comprehensive update of the zoning ordinance to make it consistent with the 2010 comp plan that has been adopted. Um, we also have critical area laws and regulations that we want to move forward and do the comprehensive update of Chapter 14. Um, we are expecting and we have been expecting for quite some time, updated critical area maps as well, which is um, something that's been on our list for quite some time to bring forward. Um, in 2008, the law changed that required jurisdictions to adopt them by 2010. The state then, because they couldn't meet their obligation, had to amend that law to at such time that it happens. Um, but we are next in line to update our critical area uh, maps in a cooperative effort with the State Critical Area Commission. So, But that will include the Planning Commission. So those are, are some of the big projects on the horizon that we want to be bringing back. And then we also have some of the um, 
other initiatives such as working with the EDC on the um, commercial land inventory and some of those other things. But we are trying to clear the deck so we can get to some of those bigger things that are going to require a lot of planning commission time and attention. Okay, so you're going to go ahead and submit all the text amendments except the uh, solar, solar one. Uh, yeah, I'll be writing and um, I wanted to mention because I know um, we've had some uh, I want to mention that what, everything I send up to the commissioners with all of your recommendations and the language that you've created and any changes that you've suggested the staff create will be sent to you at the same time it's sent to the county commissioners. Um, I fully expect that that, that, that will happen um, for the next uh, county commissioner meeting, which is scheduled for May 24th. Um, again, the, the, as um, Mr. Todd and Steve mentioned that the, there, there will be a hearing on all the rezonings on May 24th that you all that you sent up. The Graysonville plan, the information on that in terms of the comments that were received during the public um, hearing that was had by the county commissioners will be forwarded them again for May 24th. Um, they just have to accept the com comments and then they can make a decision on the plan um, unless they decide to make any substantive changes. As you well know, that's the process. That was the same process with the comp plan, the comprehensive plan. So um, just as an FYI, we held um, some of the rezonings that pertain to the Graysonville plan aside that came in with the comprehensive plan. So when the Graysonville plan gets approved, we'll move forward with those um, rezoning requests. Um, that would also require that we implement the Graysonville plan and I think there's some there might be some priorities for the County Planning Commission regarding the Graysonville plan. Good. Let me ask you uh, the section uh, immediately surrounding the emergency room as well as the property to the west of the emergency room. We changed the land use on uh, when we put the plan in to commercial mixed use type land mm -hmm. use. Could you go ahead and prepare a zoning change uh, text amendment? I think that to change the zoning requires a text amendment, right? App amendment. It would require huh? app amendment. And then Map amendment. Yes, we would have to do both. Yeah. Possible Could, text amendments. Could you go ahead and prepare them. whatever would be required in order to get that zoning in so that when the plan is approved we can proceed with that post haste? rather than having to wait? Yeah, I think there were the two recommendations on that. One was to create a medical center zone, which would include the property where the medical center is, and then the adjacent property was a recommendation for a mixed-use zone. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would say that staff will come back with some recommendations to you concerning whether we need to create a new zone for the adjacent property or there's one that's available that's in Graysonville. <coughs> we have a number of mixed-use zones that were enacted from the last Graysonville plan so I'll just what I'd like for us to do is get going on that okay again. so that when the plan is approved we can go ahead and put it in use I, I, and, I'm perfectly and not clear. have to take Are you okay with a that? longer time yeah, so we'll look at, um, it works good. <coughs> yeah um, absolutely we'll, we'll, we'll move forward with that um, okay. the implementation of the Graysonville plan absolutely is the next step in yeah. following up um, if we um, actually I think we would as we would with the comp plan, put together the matrix of changes, right. whether it's zoning changes as well, to bring back to the planning commission to plan that plan that out. Um, but yes, to move forward with it as quickly as we can, um, make it a priority um, as well as those other, other items. Um, sitting here, um, yeah, thinking about some of the other comprehensive rezonings that may be associated with Gray Graysonville or code changes, what we'll do is make that make that list and outline for the planning yeah. commission to bring back with the plan to move that forward. I'd like to go ahead and do that, assuming they're going to approve the plan so that we get that done promptly. Okay. One of the other things, just to make the planning commission aware, um, I do want to thank Holly Tompkins for her work on the McDonald's and uh, her previous work on the Chick-fil-A. We have started to go out and photograph a lot of areas in the county, started to create an uh, image library that we can share with applicants as they come in, show them uh, different features that have been approved in the last, in, in recent years, um, things that have been acceptable, what we are looking at. Um, Part of the process 
um, from where McDonald's started to where they came back with was getting those photographs of Chester. Um, the stonework, exactly, it came exactly from Red, uh, Red Apple Plaza and the redo there because we sent them photographs saying this is a project that was recently approved and, um, and architecture that was uh, deemed acceptable. Um, so Holly is working on that inventory of those pictures. Um, there was a lot of back and forth to get those changes, um, and I do, do appreciate her efforts there. Um, we're going to continue to do that so we can... Um, um, Work, work on bringing better products to the Planning Commission up front. Yep. Okay. Any other comments from the Commission? Anyone from the public care to comment? First off. Thank you. Uh, Richard Altman from uh, Bennett Point Road. And as you pro uh, may know, I follow the uh, the Queenstown um, Planning Commission's activities uh, in addition to, uh, to yours. And th this is not uh, exactly a comment, it's really a, a request f or a heads up and a request for clarification as to how the process might work. As I understand that that plan has been adopted uh, by, uh, by Queenstown and has been incorporated into our comprehensive plan um, even even though there was a disagreement um, between uh, them and and uh, yourselves about uh, some mediated language that had had been agreed to, um, a, a recent meeting at the, of their planning commission, where they were they were preparing to begin the implementation of their plan with uh, zoning text amendments, uh, indicates that there's a there is now uh, major fundamental differences of opinion between the um, uh, Queenstown commissioners and their planning commission, and uh, and the planning commissions are. I mean, the commissioner's position seems to be supported by uh, several of the major landowners within the within the planning area such that um, it would take would take a, a very comprehensive revision to the plan to, uh, to, to, to satisfy those two, two groups. I don't know what Queenstown is, is planning to do, um, but my, I guess my reason for commenting is to ask what um, posture uh, th this planning commission would take uh, on uh, on the ability of of Queenstown or the landowners of Queenstown to make uh, substantial changes in the plan at this point. Um, so, if you could, if you have anything that you could share as a well, there is no joint there is no joint plan anymore. When we, Queenstown, when the town council adopted the plan with the Changes made at the last minute without the yes. review by the Planning Commission. The county adopted. We have nothing to do with the with the Queenstown's new comprehensive plan. That position um, has been and still is, as far as I know, that we would like to work with Queenstown, as we have right. done with Centerville and the other towns, and have a joint uh, Queenstown County. Yes, plan. I, I understand what you're saying. But their uh, comp plan is not part of the county comp plan because it's not a joint plan. Yeah. When the town, when the politicians went sideways at the last minute, the county said, it's not our plan. But, um, yeah, I understand, I understand that, Chris, but uh, it's not a joint plan. But it, it, it is nevertheless incorporated into the county's comprehensive plan by virtue of the fact that they adopted it, is it not? No, no. It would have been, like, it would have been if we had proceeded as, as a joint plan. We reference um, certainly our planning areas, but we only have a joint plan with with Center Center right Center. now. We don't. In fact, we know. So, so landowners in in the Queenstown planning area are are free to uh, pr propose development um, consistent with the county zoning. 
Yes. Yeah. And, prefer, and that's happened in well, you prefer not that and, way, but that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that's helpful. Yeah. Um, didn't understand it that way. I, I thought, by virtue of the fact that it had had been swept into the plan, I, I, even though it was not a joint plan. Well, I'm right, aren't I? I'm not. I, rec I recommended language, and I hope it, I, I, we adopted it. I hope it made it into the plan. I didn't actually review the final edition to be sure it's there, but because the Queenstown plan was pending at the time that we were doing our plan, that we uh, explicitly, and I think Graysonville was also in, in that posture that we explicitly say that. Well, uh, well Graysonville isn't, isn't in, a sovereign. No, I uh, understand. Yeah. But incorporating those plans by reference was not, an endorsement of the plans because they weren't complete to something to that effect. Yeah, I think it, it got in here. I'm, I, I'm sure it did, but and I think it was because of the pending nature of the plan, and we weren't right. sure what was going to happen with Queenstown. Right. Um, I, I think what's confusing is is that this plan references everything. In other words, we pull everything from Churchill, Southersville, and everything else, and and recognize it in this plan, and we statistically analyze it, but um, unless the two bodies, governing bodies, jointly adopt them together, then, you know, they, we have no authority over them, they have no authority over us. Um, if Centerville amends their plan, we do it jointly. The, it comes through here, just like it did with the municipal growth element and the water resource element, it came back here and then went to both the county commissioners and stuff like that. So if they if they amend, if they are, are are free to amend this plan, their plan, not you, not the yeah. joint plan, uh, they can they can they can do that. They yeah. can do that. Yes. And, and without any consultation with the county. Right. Yes, and without any um, uh, impact on right. on the right. county. Comprehensive plan. No. Okay, that's that's helpful clarification. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? I hear a motion. Move we adjourn. Okay. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned.